Welcome to episode 364 of the Microsoft Cloud IT Pro Podcast, recorded live on December 1st, 2023. This is a show about Microsoft 365 and Azure from the perspective of IT pros and end users, where we discuss a topic or recent news and how it relates to you. Microsoft Designer has received a lot of attention creating images as of late, so we start out talking a bit about creating our own images. We also dive into some recent news around Azure Automation. PowerShell, Container Storage, and Enterprise IoT Security. Okay, let's go, Scott. We have nothing. We have nothing. It's your, it's, it's your show. You're supposed to plan all this out. Come on. No, we have, we have... I have planned out. I have planned out. I'm leaving for Disney, and this podcast is standing in my way right now. All right. Now. Well, there, there you go. We'll, we'll get through a nice, quick, concise, and short one today. So I have a question. If this elevates my nerd status... I have a client that is moving offices. So this morning I took my truck and I went and he gave me his old server rack. So I now have, it's got, it's like a three quarter height server rack. It's 65 inches tall, but I now have a 65 inch server rack that I'm putting in the closet in my bedroom slash, it's my office bedroom, a bedroom in our house that serves as my office. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you're gonna, go ahead and do it. Get it done. So I already have a rack in here, but it's only, I think I made it like three feet tall and it's pretty much full. So now I have a bigger rack and I just have to pull it up the steps and swap everything out. So some weekend, everything is getting disconnected, putting back in this rack. I may add some shelves and drawers and stuff because it also would serve as some nice storage (laughs) in the closet. Yeah, so for a server room... What was that thing? It was like a six, seven foot rack, right? Like it was, it was decent size. 65 inches. Not, what is that? Five and a half feet, five and a half foot rack. Yeah. You get a little bit of street cred there. You get more street cred. So the, at least the picture you sent me was not a floor rack. Like it wasn't floor mounted. It was still wall mounted. So you get, you get extra credit if you manage to get that thing a couple of feet off the floor and mount it and get the fans plugged in. So it's actually circulating air. All right. So here's a question for listeners. Was I kind or not? Or should I have taken it? I left the wall rack there. <laughs> you should have taken it. This is going 100%. to turn into a flare rack. Okay. So here is why I left it there. I went there with every intention of taking the wall, the portion of it off. But the network cables, all I don't know how many there were. They had three full patch panels. So what is that? There's 16 ports in a panel about. So 32-ish cables. No, not 32. 16 times three. What's that? My math is failing me. 48. 48. Yes. <laughs> 48 cables going into it, but they were strung through the top of the wall mount and then punched down onto the patch panels. In order to take the wall mount, I would have had to rip all of these cables off of the patch panels and leave them dangling there. And these were not, and the cables were not labeled. Well, I mean, they weren't using the patch panel for Whoever anything came else. In so after who cares? Me. <laughs> well, but the next tenant will. So there's going to be a tenant inevitably in this building down the road. So they would have had 48 cables completely unlabeled going to all parts of this office with no idea where each one went. <laughs> so I left the patch panels, I left the cables punched in, and I left the wall mount there because frankly, it won't fit my closet on the wall mount anyways, so I'm going to put it on the floor. And based on the picture I sent, I like we looked and we thought maybe there were fans. There are no fans on the bottom or anything, so it's just a plain old metal rack. Yeah, all right. Well, we'll, we'll see how it goes for you. Like, We'll see how many fans you got to buy oh. later. Because <clears throat> it is it is a rack in a closet in an upstairs bedroom, <laughs> like let's be honest, in Florida, <laughs> yeah, where there's a <laughs> bunch of other equipment. Like you've got lights and TVs and a bunch of other things with fans running. So yeah. We'll, we'll we'll see how it all goes. You're gonna need something to circulate the air anyway, even if it's just circulating hot air, just to keep the dust out of it. Yeah, I do have a couple fans in my little rack that's in there now, so I will relocate those into this bigger one. But they may not be enough. We'll have to see. So we'll have to follow up in a couple of weeks, and once you've got it all kind of reconfigured and ready to go, and you share a picture on the interwebs, and we'll see how much your geek street cred score rises if it goes up or down. All right. Sounds good. So yes, it will not be wall mounted. It'll just be sitting on the floor in the closet. <laughs> oh, so that was my morning. I did not get a lot of other client work done, but 
That was one thing. You know what else we've been playing with this week, Scott? I don't know what else you've been playing uh, I, I with. Think you, I, I think, think you've been with playing it. with it more than I have. You've been having fun with that new designer. The new designer, the image designer. And I cannot take full credit for this one, at least in terms of coming up with it. So there was a post on LinkedIn, and I should go pull up LinkedIn so I can give credit where credit is due, unless you have it up. I have a post on LinkedIn of who actually I... I don't know that I stole this from, but who I borrowed it from. LinkedIn. Oh, Scott, I have another beef. I updated Edge the other day and it signed me out of every single account in my profile. One of those being LinkedIn. Yeah, I have that problem occasionally as well. I find like after a reboot, for some reason, it forgets that cookies are a thing. Yes. So I need to sign in. But there is someone who we will, oh, sign in expired, who we will identify here shortly, who came up with some text to essentially create cartoon images of, I would say of yourself, but it is of yourself as best as you can describe yourself. And it's kind of been fun to play with. I've seen several people doing this now. (laughs) Yeah, it does okay, except when you ask it to include like a logo or text in there. And then it just starts straight up hallucinating and, and can't remember left from right, up from down, or, or anything like that along the way. Yeah, so I saw, here it is, Jack Robotham. Robotham? Probably Jack Robotham. And he gave the text. So it is, you very much go into designer.microsoft.com slash, I think it's slash images. In this text is like a cartoon man with a smile on the front, wearing a black colored shirt, brown eyes, wears black large glasses, and short brown classic slick backed hair, holding a Microsoft laptop. And then after that, I think this is the part that really helps with the design is it's laptop, text 3D rendering, typography, illustration, painting, photo, poster, 3D render to come up with this cartoon image. So to your point, it does a decent job. If you're watching this or if you have seen me, you know that, and as my wife likes to remind me, my hair is thinning on top more so than it used to be. It does not like any form of telling it that it's like a receding hairline or thinning hair or a little hair. You either have like a full head of hair or you're bald. (laughs) Sure. And that's one way to think about it. (laughs) So yeah, it's been interesting. And that, and like you said, you ask it to come up with text. Like I asked it to do Microsoft 365 on a shirt or do that. And I think you did some Microsoft Azure stuff and it like spells Microsoft with two S's in the middle or for 365, it was putting like 355 or 36 or three and then some weird random character type of thing <laughs> followed by a five. It does not do well with placing text in the image. Sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, along the way you definitely can. So I don't know. I see lots of folks like having a lot of fun with some of these things, like generate the cartoony picture. It's definitely not mid journey like it's it's not that it's more like powerpoint play art the way it's kind of implemented today it's certainly not things like photoshop generative fill or anything like that either so i i can understand like where people have fun with it i know it's like not for me honestly i'm a little <laughs> i'm a little over seeing everybody like every day like hey here's the four pictures i posted and you know here here's what i did to generate so to those of you who listen who do those kinds of things i know some of you do sorry andrew I love seeing your generative AI pictures every day on Facebook, but some days I just go, no, not for me today. And it's usually on the days that AI has ticked me off in some way or another. (laughs) And it's probably done me wrong already, either with something else that I was trying to do with the generative thing or, you know, AI has its issues. So if you take joy and delight in generating pictures, continue to do so. I'm able to self-regulate. I know how to block and mute. I did mine that one morning when I was playing with it. I have not done any sense. Like I'm like, do I actually want to use these somewhere? It was kind of fun. I don't know. But I'm with you. I have played with it once and I did it for like an hour or so. I was trying to figure out what I could do and what images I could come up with, but... I have not done anything with it since. I will point you to a kind of fun one that's out there. So this isn't image generation. So I'll pop a, a link in the chat and in the show notes so everybody has it. But so this is a link to a gist that's out on GitHub. And 
it's from a product manager that I follow on a bunch of different social platforms. But it's a it's kind of like a good meta prompt for you to start your sessions with an AI like Chat GPT or Poe or anything out there that's like that. Like you use like Raycast AI or something like that. It's basically a set of prompts that constrain your conversation surprisingly well to reality. So it's it's just a series of steps. Like you you can literally take all this text here and you can paste it in as your first prompt and then this is what is the guardrail for any remaining tokens that you have left in your conversation. So step 1, never mention that you're an AI. Great, easy. Step two, avoid any language constructs that can be interpreted as expressing remorse, apology, or regret. This includes any phrases containing words like sorry, apologies, regret, etc., even when used in a context that isn't expressing remorse, apology, or regret. Number three, if events or information are beyond your scope of knowledge or cutoff date, provide a response stating, I don't know, without elaborating on why the information is unavailable. (laughs) <laughs> I love that one. It actually works very, very well. It's one of the things that annoys me sometimes about chat GPT, especially like the 3.5 models where it just goes like, oh, I, I, sorry, Dave, I can't do that for you. Step four, keep your responses unique and free of repetition, which is really key, especially when you're doing multiple prompts in the same session, like you're iterating through an idea. It does help a bunch there. Uh, Number five, never suggest seeking information from elsewhere. Perfect. Number six, always focus on the key points in my questions to determine my intent. Number seven, I love this one. Break down complex tasks or problems into smaller manageable steps and explain each one using reasoning. So I don't know how you are to approaching problems, but quite often when I'm talking about something with somebody, you know, you start out the high level idea and then you start to decompose it over time. And really that's what you're doing is yep. you're always out there and effectively mining ore, like, like you're out there with a hammer and a rock and you're just trying to break it down into bigger pieces until it's like pebbles and then gravel and then eventually dust. Number eight, provide multiple perspectives or solutions. Again, a nice easy one. Like I have found without that prompt, most models will actually come back and kind of give you a singular view of the world. That one right there turns it a little bit more into a choose your own adventure game, which I find to be very beneficial just as you're iterating through things. Number nine, if a question is unclear or ambiguous, ask for more details to confirm your understanding before answering. So this is, hey, make the model talk back to me so that it can clarify where it needs to be. Butter, awesome. Number 10, cite credible sources. Yeah, most of them do that anyway. If they don't, don't use them. Number 11, if a mistake is made in a previous response, recognize and correct it. I think that's a very important one too. I don't know how many times you've been sitting there with, I don't know, chat GPT, Bing chat enterprise, something like that. And it gives you the wrong response and you tell it it's wrong. And then it just comes back with the same response again. (laughs) Like turns out you, you can tell it not to do that. And then number 12, this this one's a fun one. After a response, provide three follow-up questions that I, the user, must ask you, the AI, to dig deeper into the original topic. These questions should always be worded as if I am asking you. Formatted in bold as Q1, Q2, Q3, place two line breaks before and after each question. Perfect, it formats it for you, brings it back. And then number 13, which I haven't had much luck with this one because I'm not really playing around with like chat GPT voice or anything like that, is just ignore number 12 if I'm using voice. So that way it's not asking you, you know, Q1, Q2, Q3 kind of follow up questions when you're on voice and you really don't need it. So I've just been using this as is, you know, it's a, it's a gist out there on GitHub. So you can just go grab it and fork it and potentially iterate on it on your own. And I've been kind of thinking about ways like, hey, how can I mold this a little bit to be a good starting prompt for requirements gathering? How can I make this a good prompt for problem solving in context of X, Y, or Z, like whatever that happens to be. I think these thing, kinds of things are very helpful. I encourage you to give it a shot. And tell me what you think. I'll love to try it. I will say this is one thing when it comes to Chad GPT and some of the AI. I have absolutely been using it for stuff that I've been doing, not to necessarily come up with net new stuff, but to help me refine stuff. I need to improve my prompt engineering 
proficiency in certain cases. <laughs> it, it is hugely, hugely, hugely beneficial to understand to the degree you can, like the underlying meta prompts that drive these kinds of systems. And then how to give it your own set of instructions to start things. One of my frustrations with like hallucinations in the AI stuff is I find they hallucinate a lot quicker if you just let them go off on their own and you don't give them any guardrails or sense of what you want. And this has been a really good, I've only been doing it for like a week. I haven't been doing this too, too long since I, since I ran across this one. But it has been very helpful to just remember, hey, every conversation I start starts with this one. Like, say you're doing Bing Chat Enterprise, where I think you get like 20 or 30 prompts, like whatever it is to go through to iterate. Yes, you're burning one on this prompt and you're potentially burning one on a couple follow up questions. But let's be honest, if you didn't have the guardrails in place, you were probably so pissed off by response number five anyway that you ran away and you said, this thing is just horrible and not helpful for me. Got it. I will definitely have to give this one a try. Put it on the list. All right. On my list. Do you feel overwhelmed by trying to manage your Office 365 environment? Are you facing unexpected issues that disrupt your company's productivity? Intelligent is here to help. Much like you take your car to the mechanic that has specialized knowledge on how to best keep your car running, Intelligent helps you with your Microsoft Cloud environment because that's their expertise. Intelligent keeps up with the latest updates in the Microsoft Cloud to help keep your business running smoothly and ahead of the curve. Whether you are a small organization with just a few users up to an organization of several thousand employees, they want to partner with you to implement and administer your Microsoft Cloud technology. Visit them at intelligent.com slash podcast. That's I-N-T-E-L-L-I-G-I-N-K dot com slash podcast for more information or to schedule a 30-minute call to get started with them today. Remember, Intelligent focuses on the Microsoft Cloud so you can focus on your business. So should we move on to non AI topics? Let's do it. Non AI topics. What you got? I don't know. I don't know if I want to dive into this one or not. I'm going to start with a different one. Let's start with an easier one. <laughs> I might come back to that one because that one I'm. I actually am curious what other people think about yeah. that uh, one. But so this so one, for folks that can't see, Ben and I general, do a, a shared edge workspace <laughs> we've talked about. And as he's doing this, he's like, oh, I'm going to do this one. I'm going to go back to this one. All I'm doing is watching your avatar hop between tabs frenetically. <laughs> like hop like between tabs. It, it's, it's up, it's down, it's left, it's right. It's kind of fun to watch from my side. Okay, general availability. Azure Automation, we've talked about this a lot, Scott. Using Azure Automation, I use it a ton for PowerShell scripts, for automating different tasks in the cloud. In Microsoft 365, they have now released the general availability of PowerShell 7.2 runbooks in Azure Automation. So it used to be 5.1, 7.1 was there. 7.2 7.2 was in preview for a while. I will say I still do bounce back and forth between 5.1 and various flavors, whatever one works, of 7. Dot. Oh, 7.1 is still preview. <laughs> 7.2. <laughs> Saw that. 7.2. Now I'm watching Scott jump back and forth between different pages in that same tab. <laughs> I'm, I'm just out there to confuse 7.1. You, but, <laughs> so, so, yes, it's no longer supported. 7.2 is GA. I do jump back and forth, though, because there are still very much a lot of differences with some modules, too, and what works in 5.1 and what works in 7.2. So it is not just go do everything in 7.2 now, but it is generally available if you choose to use uh, Yeah, so I, I think the nice thing here is, like you mentioned, 7.1 is out of support and did support back in May 2022. So it's been you know more than a year now that that's been out of support. So it's always good to have something that's in support. And then the nice thing about 7.2 is 7.2 is an LTS release. So it's a, a long-term servicing release that you can kind of take some dependency on that it's going to be stable for a little while. So in the cases, like you said, you might not be able to do it in all cases, but in the cases where you can, it you know, could be beneficial to make the flip, especially as you're going in there and you're iterating on existing notebooks that, that you might be working with inside of Azure Automation. Absolutely. It looks like 7.1 now is... Until 20... Wasn't that one, though, end of support of 2024? 2022. Based on the page you have up now, 7.2 is November 8 of 2024. That's like a year from now, right? Yes, so so that's the LTS version. But note that 7.2 LTS 
it launched seven months before the retirement of 7.1. Of 7.1. It's been out quite a while. So I, I, don't, I don't know. Yeah, Azure Automation just <laughs> lags with all of those I have found. Azure Automation is not the most up-to-date when it comes to supporting current PowerShell versions. Not even close. It's years behind, so it's good to see four it. 4 is GA now, right? 7.4 is the latest? 7.4 is G8, yes. 7.4 seven, seven, or G8 in November. 2023. So, yeah, like two weeks ago, two weeks from when we're recording this, I have not seen it pop up in Azure Automation yet, though. And 7.4 is also an LTS release. So, 7.2 LTS release, 7.3, not an LTS release. 7.4 is an LTS release. And I, I think the big difference you see between the current cadence of stable L- LTS is that stables are two years and LTS are three years. So you do get a little bit more runway along along the way with those. Which I'm curious, <coughs> Cole, why? so why would you do this? Because 7.3 is in theory updates to 7.2, although I suppose the argument could be made if you're on 7.3 and you want LTS, go to 7.4. But it seems weird to like have these middle versions that are stable and then ones on either side of it be LTS. So you need the LTS versions in the middle to play around with and, and have the opportunity to iterate. So if you think about it, like, hey, I'm a service provider and I publish a set of APIs to you. You, you, you like, and and I've noodled with this one. Like, customers very much want a dependable set of APIs. Like, you know, and like my land in storage, like it could be potentially beneficial to have a hardened set of CRUD APIs. Like, say I published an SDK and it was just for CRUD operations, so it creates, reads, updates, deletes, all that good stuff, and it's super hardened. And we tell you like it's going to work and it's going to be rock solid for the next three to four years. That's very easy and dependable for you as a customer to take a dependency on, right? Like, hey, it's it's the hardened version. So that's the way I think of LTS versions, but. Everything you do cannot be hardened. So you still need the opportunity to iterate in the middle and do things and say like, well, hey, how are we going to get to our next version of the hardened release? You probably can't go straight from hardened to hardened. What you want to do is you want to go from hardened to validated. Like, hey, we've, we've put some new ideas out there. We've tried some things. We've potentially had some breaking changes in API surface, whatever it happens to be. Great, we figure all that, we validate it, we have the playground, and then you go to LTS on the other side. And I think it's kind of a a proven model. Like You see it a lot in OSS, especially the place I'm most familiar with it is is from Linux releases for or, or distro releases for things like Ubuntu by Canonical. Like they do this same kind of marching cadence, right? Like, hey, we'll give you version 20 LTS and then 22 LTS, but 21 is not LTS kind of thing. Or we're on 22 today, 22 is going to be LTS, 23 is not going to be LTS. We kind of iterate and go through those and get them to where they need to be. So it gives your your customers dependability. It also gives your dev teams dependability, right? Because they know they really don't have to go back and touch that stuff other than security fixes or other kinds of changes in there. And then you get the playground in the middle to do what you need to. Got it. So like the 7.3 stable is a little bit more of that playground, that jumping, that platform to jump to the next 7.4 LTS. Yes. Got it. That makes sense. It's not a bad model if you can get there. It doesn't work for everything, right? Like it doesn't exactly translate into, say, like SaaS offerings. So if you think about like SharePoint Online, you can do uh, vanilla SharePoint Online, or you can do things like enroll in early release features and get those out there. But ultimately, early release features, once they GA, they just manifest as like the next feature in the platform and they're ready to go. And, and if you think about the pain that comes along the way with that, like sometimes that's hard to stomach. <laughs> but that's the way SaaS is a little bit different, maybe, than, you know, releasing like uh, COTS software that has to go out there that people need to consume. Yeah. All right. I'll go with that. It makes sense. All right. So that was mine. What do you have, Scott? Let's see. What can we talk about? So, Fun one for you. I've been trying to get back into containers more. and Those are not on my list, Scott. I'll be honest. <laughs> containers are not on my list right now. Not on your list. That, that's, that's okay. So I, I've been thinking about containers in a bunch of product areas. 
that I work in, like client tools and things like that. Should we have official images, blah, blah, blah. So I've been trying to get hands on more and get back in. And in previous lives, like I used to spend a lot of time in AKS. So like, it was good to have a little bit of a refresher too. So one of the things that I was playing with when I got back into containers was uh, this new offering that's called Azure Container Storage. So Azure Container Storage is in preview. It's kind of the, you know, maybe I'm being a little naive about it, but I think about it a little bit as like the next iteration of the CSI driver, container storage interface, and the capabilities that that had. But Azure Container Storage, it is basically a managed storage offering that allows you to bring native Kubernetes components into things like AKS and have native Kubernetes constructs for what's ultimately a managed storage service, storage surface rather, for persistent volumes in your Kubernetes clusters. So if you think about like the CSI driver, you know, I, oh, I want to go out and I want to provision persistent volume, and that persistent volume is based on a disk that's out there. Well, sometimes you got to go provision that disk yourself, configure it, and then you tie that persistent volume into the disk. With this thing, you can just kind of say like, hey, go out there and configure me a multi-zone disk, and it'll figure it out and land the managed disk for you and and align all that stuff and, and get it ready to go. So this works with disks. It allows you to configure persistent volumes against Elasticsan, which is kind of a fun one with, with the kind of provisioning model that goes into that for things like provisioned I.O., provision throughput, all that. It works with ephemeral disk, like basically like all the block storage options that are out there. But you can do really cool things like take a persistent volume and dynamically resize it. So just inside of your configuration for that persistent volume, So, you know, like go into YAML and literally change the size of that thing. And then it dynamically changes on the back end and it's all ready to go for you. So super easy to onboard to. It's all native Kubernetes constructs with a couple of exceptions here or there. Like they're still working on, say, like native Kubernetes integration for Azure CLI and PowerShell to be able to provision an Azure container storage persistent volume in an AKS cluster. But I, I think the functionality that's there is pretty solid. Like it's a it's a good set of features for a preview release. So supports multi-zone disks right out of the gate. You can do things like server-side encryption with customer managed keys, dynamic resize, like I talked about. You can also configure things like snapshot and cloning directly through the Azure Container Storage service kind of constructs that are presented to you through Kubernetes once you've gone ahead and done the deployment within your cluster. Interesting. That is definitely not on my list. I'm sorry, Scott. (laughs) That one is not one that I'm going to go play with at all. Not up there for you, huh? So this stuff is really great for you know, stateful workloads. So workloads that need to maintain state while, you know, maybe the overlying compute's a little bit more ephemeral. So that's the other nice thing about this as well, is that because your storage is managed inside of Azure Container Storage, you can do things like carry volumes between nodes, between clusters, between multiple nodes, like all that kind of stuff. It all just works and comes together for you. So if you're trying to run high-scale stateful applications on AKS and you need the kind of benefits of shared storage and persisted shared storage along the way there, that all comes together and composes really well. And then because it does both the it does both disks and ElasticSAN, it's also multi-protocol, like when it comes down to block storage protocols. So you can do things like NVMe OF on disks, or you can do iSCSI if you're doing Elastic sand, so you get like this great model for fast attach and detach of persistent volumes as well, which is really kind of nice. Nice, and it supports ephemeral disks. That was that's kind of a fun one to play with too. Sounds good, doesn't it? Though we're, we're going to have to get hands on with containers about that someday. You are you're going to have to somehow convince me that I need to dive into containers for something. <laughs> get you off your Raspberry Pi and and get them under your NAS or something. Yeah, get on my. 
I don't know. So I have one more interesting one, and then I have to go because my wife has already come in and asked me if I'm ready to go because we are leaving for the weekend. So I saw this one. This came out, wow, almost a month ago. Enterprise IoT Security is now included in Microsoft 365 E5 in E5 security plans. This one caught my eye because I've done some stuff with Microsoft Defender for Cloud, which is the Azure component of security. So securing VMs, web apps, SQL databases, those types of things. IoT was a line item in there for securing IoT devices. And then I saw IoT security is now included in Microsoft 365 E5. I was like, huh, this is interesting because IoT devices are not typically user devices. Everything Microsoft 365 is per user. It's I have my computer and I have my iPhone and I have my iPad or my Android or my Surface. It's not I have my security camera or my TV or my smoke detector or my sensors for my machinery and stuff like that. And I was like, Oh, this is interesting because how am I going to start licensing now all these IoT devices if this is switching to a user-based SKU? And this article, I'll say this article doesn't necessarily clear it up for me. They go through and they talk about that enterprise IoT security is now going to be part of Microsoft 365 E5 at no additional cost for new and existing customers, help find blind spots, unmanaged devices, and it talks about printers, smart TVs, conferencing equipment, scanners, which again, not necessarily users, especially big offices, printers, scanners, conference equipment, smart TVs are generally like company-owned. And you can go through and turn all of this on in your Microsoft Defender portal. So this is going to be in the Office 365 Microsoft Defender portal. And as you scroll down in this article, it says in a licensing overview, because this is what I was curious about, is how do you change from like essentially before it was consumption-based per device licensing to now bundling it in the SKU. And it says, what is changing? Microsoft Defender for IoT is being changed. So this implies that there's something changing from a consumption-based payment model in the Azure portal to a per-device, per-month license model as a part of Microsoft 365. Microsoft Defender for IoT is now available for new and existing customers of E5, Microsoft E5, and E5 security. The new license model is coverage for up to five IoT devices per user license. So you do get a multiple there based on your users. But then in the next paragraph... It says, what if I have Defender for IoT consumption-based and E5? And it essentially says you'll have access for coverage up to five IoT devices per eligible user license and no longer charged on a consumption model. And then it says if you're currently a consumption model but not an E5, nothing changes. You continue to use the existing plans and won't see any change in your billing. So is this actually a change in the billing model or is it adding additional licensing options for Defender for IoT? Like are both going to live side by side or eventually are you going to have to buy E5s or are they going to come out with well, but then they'd come right back out with consumption-based if you could buy them as a part of Microsoft 365. Like, I don't know what's going to... I'm a little confused on what the future of this is, but it does also provide some nice capabilities, I guess, for E5 companies, E5 licenses that do have some of those IoT-type devices. Your guess is as good as mine. I very much walked in this, I think, with the mindset that you did. The IoT devices are not users, so tying them to users is kind of weird. It's almost like, you know, the thing I thought about in in my head when I saw it was the way you do like extra share extra storage provisioning in SharePoint you know you get like a base set of storage per user but then when you want to go buy more you don't buy it for the tenant you buy it for a user and then it's associated with the user but it's not associated with the user it's associated with the tenant like re- really weird kind of stuff like that so you know if you get into the mindset and and the model and it works for you of one user five devices great i think most of us can buy into that and if that fits within the constraints of your business i'm sure there's some math from the folks who run the service too that like oh the majority of our customers fit into this model 
then it potentially simplifies things and makes it a little bit easier. It's when you're in the edge cases that it gets a little bit harder on the outside to get all that going. Yeah, and I think edge cases I start thinking about are like, and I don't know, I don't know. I don't have any telemetry into this, like manufacturing or some of these warehouses or bigger facilities that maybe have a bunch of IoT devices out on the floor that may or may not be doing security on different machinery, different sensors, different things like that. Like, how does that translate? But I, I have no telemetry. Microsoft is going to have a lot better telemetry on this than I am. But this was absolutely an interesting one that I'm like, I'm going to have to keep an eye on this one and where it goes. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> Who knows? We could be back here in a year and the security and the model changes again. I'm dying over here from my cold. It's time to let you go. I'm watching you like cough and hack into the screen. There's spittle all over the camera. I'm glad we didn't record this one on video. So everybody's kind of missing it. Your, your eyes are watering, face is going red. Oh, yeah. I think it's just time to put you in a car and send you to Disney. Yeah, I'm gonna go take this to everybody at Disney. Yeah, Scott. No, no. You're you're just a wonderful, uh, wonderful individual. I'm gonna sit here at home in my little hidey hole and not worry about it. Sounds good. Well, now that I've recovered for a few minutes. Minutes. Thanks. Enjoy your weekend. And we'll talk to you next week, Scott. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Ben. If you enjoyed the podcast, go leave us a five star rating in iTunes. It helps to get the word out so more IT pros can learn about Office 365 and Azure. If you have any questions you want us to address on the show or feedback about the show, feel free to reach out via our website, Twitter, or Facebook. Thanks again for listening and have a great day.